Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Monday, April 15th, 2019. I want to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And if you could hit the like button, guys, that would be terrific. All right, guys, I have a fascinating article for you here today. Some important research done by these two um, authors of a book called, uh, that wrote a book called The Ages of the Giants. Um... The Cultural History of the Tall Ones in Prehistoric America, which I think is a pretty rational title for a book. And, you know, these people are serious researchers uh, named Jason Jarrell and, um, oh, um, Sarah Farmer, that's their names. Uh, Jason Jarrell and Sarah Farmer wrote this book, Ages of the Giants, Cultural History of the Tall Ones in Prehistoric America, which is definitely on my must-read list, and I got to get that soon and check that out, because this article is just fascinating, and it's about an Adena mound called the Spearpoint Mound in uh, Ohio, and um, there were many Adena mounds in the Ohio River Valley, and apparently hundreds and hundreds of them were destroyed um, up into the um, mid-20th century. So um, you have to ask yourself, you know, how could this possibly happen? And I've actually gone over it before in one of my videos on this guy, Alice Herdlishka, who is the head of the Bureau of Ethnology, which I believe was created just for him. And um, this guy is basically a monkey's buttocks, you know, a purple-ass baboon, backwards baboon, okay, that set anthropology and archaeology back some 20, 30, 40 years, 100 years, you know. So any arguments of anthropologists or anything today, it's probably... Uh, Probably an advertisement, guys, coming from the online magazine. I'm sorry about that. Just there's tons of advertisements um, on this magazine, unfortunately. So in any case, these guys wrote this fascinating article about a man that's no longer there. And they did some expert research and sort of their own interpretation of what the mound's meanings are and everything. So they go over it, and I think they do a fine job of it and give a very rational explanation for everything. So let's go through this. This is an Adena mound here um, in Ohio. It's at a different location. It's not the Spear Point Mound, because the Spear Point Mound doesn't exist. But this is uh, somewhere in a cemetery, I believe, um, in the middle of a cemetery. <clears throat> okay, so let's go over this article here because, again, I just, it's a, definitely a, a uh, fascinating uh, article and some key research here. September uh, 2018, Jason Jarrell and Sarah Farmer. Okay, the Spearhead Man, Interpretation of a Forgotten Adena Burial Site. The people of the Adena culture were some of the first to construct burial mounds and earthworks in the Ohio River Valley. Early Adena sites date between 1000 and 200 BC, according to their chronology, and usually consist of either an isolated burial mound or a small group of no more than two or three tumuli. The early mounds contain extended and flexed burials, cremations in pits, and bark-lined tombs and represent the general, generational burial places of local communities or hamlets. Beginning sometime around 200 BC and continuing to around 300 AD, they say, multiple dispersed Adena communities began to assemble together at specific ritual areas, construct large burial mounds and ceremonial earthwork enclosures. This development in late Adena is considered to represent the expression of a broad socio-political identity. Okay, and they cite the research, I guess, by other archaeologists or whatever it is that they may agree with or whatever, but, you know, we don't know. And if, again, if you've gone over my video, prove it, all the archaeology is 
much of it is theoretical, guys, and you know, nothing wrong with it being theoretical as long as you and I and the researcher knows that and archaeologists and anthropologists, we all know that. The problem is, is that there's this third group of people who read that stuff, my stuff, whatever it is, and get a sort of, you know, single-mindedness about it that can't be broken or shaken and they think stuff is proof and not, it's not proof and the facts and, you know, you know, interpretation and everything else. They have no idea about any of this stuff. Okay, so here are the two burials in the Spearhead Man, old photographs of them. And, um, sorry, it's a, they're old photographs, and I don't really have a high end computer for you here. But you can go to the article in Ancient Origins, I'll put a link to it. <clears throat> okay. Some of the late Adena sites became vast ritual landscapes, such as the Wolf Plains Mound Group in Athens County, Ohio, and the Charleston Earthworks in Kanawha County, West Virginia. Late Adena Mounds often contained various types of log tombs and also many more cremations than the earlier structures. While excavations of some of the larger Adena Mounds were well documented in the 20th century, others were destroyed with very little professional documentation and forgotten. This article, rep this article presents the available information for one such mound from southern Ohio. Okay. The Spearhead Mound. The largest burial mound in Hamilton County, the Spearhead Mound is located in Anderson Township, situated close to the southern bank of Little Dry Run, which ran past its base. In the 1800s, early surveyors of the mound documented its wonderful size and speculated about its contents. Timothy Day, 1839, reported that the mound was 40 feet, 12.19 meters high, and 600 feet, 182.88 meters in circumference. Right, that's pretty large. And suggested that it could hold the remains of a mighty chief. The Spearhead Mound was later surveyed by the archaeologist pioneer Charles Matt. Sorry about that, guys. Gotta turn that off. It's all the advertisements from this stupid, uh, online magazine here. Okay. Where was I? Okay, 620 feet, 25 feet high, 190.5 meters in circumference, and 39 feet, 11.89 meters high. At the time of Met's research, the landowner forbade excavations in the mound. Okay, so why that didn't continue, I have no idea. They should have just continued doing that, but they didn't, unfortunately for us. All right, sorry about this. Okay, so there's the spearhead mound. When it was more or less just a roadside attraction, and that was what it was made, it was a joke, and the herd list could let this go on, and... Um, no serious excavations were done there, and he was in charge of the Bureau of Ethnology at this time, I believe. And also that uh, the other fellow there, Holmes, as well, same sort of deal with their attitude. <clears throat> by the late 1920s, the mound was owned by Willis Walker and W.H. Harbor. Walker, who was apparently an enterprising individual, began to tunnel into the mound in 1927 with the intention of setting up a for-profit museum inside the ancient tumulus. According to S. Frederick Starr, 1960, Walker, quote, tunneled around in the bowels of the mound, strung up electric lights, and by charging a nominal admission fee, made enough money to pull himself out of the Depression. Unquote. So uh, he wasn't looked kindly upon. Okay, and there's one of the tunnel constructions in there, like a mine. Interior of the main tunnel at Spearhead Mound. Note electric lighting and boxes of excavated material along the left wall. Okay, so who knows where that went to. The contents of the Spearhead Mound as described in this article are derived from several sources, including an informative paper by the late James Murphy published in The Ohio Archaeologist, Murphy, 1984, a book by S. Frederick Starr, 1960, and a detailed press article by W. L. Brillmeyer, 1927. So these guys did pretty good research there. 
Between May and October of 1927, Walker and his assistants tunneled 350 feet, 106.68 meters into the mound, fortifying the passages with posts and oak planking, Murphy, 1984. The first burial encounter by the intruder was around 55 feet, 106.68 meters from the west side of the mound, where the remains of a single individual were found in a prepared bark tomb, along with remnants of animal skins or leather clothing or wrappings, or possibly a leather headdress. Murphy, 1984. <clears throat> the next important discovery consists of a group of burials encountered at the level of the tunnel floor. All that remained of the first burial found in this area were the legs of a badly deteriorated skeleton. Beneath the legs of this burial was another skeleton buried face downward and missing the feet. Another skeleton with a stone kelp was unearthed nearby. Apparently, all burials in this cluster were associated with individual piles of white chalk of a white chalky substance, Murphy, nineteen eighty four, which could have been the residue of deposits of ritual pigments. So interesting, white chalky substance there. What that was for, who knows? Speculate on that. Okay, so here are these guys, Walker, with another fellow, you know, pretending to be archaeologists. And who knows, you know, for all we know, they did do good archaeology, but, you know, we don't know what the, uh, you know, dark side of this whole thing is, really. Okay, despite this excellent research here, because they don't know where the artifacts went to, and there's hundreds of ants that deserve this kind of investigation. The following passage from the report by Brill Mayer, 1927, includes several interesting comments about these last two burials. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and this is in 1927, remember. Okay, quote, they, the legs of the deteriorated skeleton were removed, and the skeleton of a giant, okay, you see it right there, I hope. Okay. The skeletons of a giant, okay, who had been buried face down when it was brought to view. Hmm, interesting way. The feet of the skeleton are missing, but the remains from the top of the skull to the ankles measures six feet and two inches in length. The skeleton of another giant was found nearby. The smaller bones of its framework had deteriorated into dust to commingle with the earth surrounding it. But the larger bones remain intact, and the outline of the skeleton is plainly imprinted in the soil. Okay, so it's not the skeleton, it's the imprint. <laughs> The length of the skeleton from the crown of the skull to the heel is six feet and seven inches. So, six foot seven inch skeleton, and people are going to say, wow, you know, so what? As I went over in my video, Homo Giganticus, all right, that that was a highly unusual size at the, in that era. Any, any time before 1800, that would be somebody of uh, unusual size. Most people had, hadn't changed since the Stone Age, were somewhere in the area of between five foot three, okay, adult males, between five foot three and five foot six, okay? by 1800 okay after 1800 people started to get a little bit taller and it stopped since then so all their theories about why we were evolving taller now have stopped so and they don't know why all right <clears throat> it is possible that there was another skeleton recovered from this group but no details are known while tall the two quote-unquote giants reported from the spearhead mount do not represent the tallest adena known okay as the present authors have extensively documented in the ages of the giants, the cultural history of the tall ones in prehistoric America, okay, at woo.com 2017, so I'll have to get that there, the remains of powerfully built, the remains of powerfully built individuals reaching 7 feet, 2.13 meters in stature, and even taller have been discovered in many Adena and Hopewell Mounds in the eastern woodlands, including sites beyond the Ohio Valley. Okay? Alright, see that there? Alright. It is possible... Okay, we read that already. Let me go over it. Continuing to the center of the mound, Walker encountered the remnants of an Adena log tomb in the roof of the tunnel, which contained the remains of one individual with two copper bracelets 
and a stem spear point. Cremations were encountered through the body of the spearhead mound. Brillmayer reported numerous, depo quote, numerous deposits of ashes and human bodies, unquote, during his visit. Okay, so that's the roof of the thing there with the copper bracelets in it and everything, so. Oh, shoot. Sorry, guys. Let me get back here again. Ay, ay, ay. Sorry. On the floor of the mound, another log crypt measuring 7 feet, 2.13 meters long, and 3.5 feet, 1.07 meters wide, was eventually encountered, which at the time of Walker's excavation was considered an altar. In fact, Starr, 1960, reported that at the time of the mound's ultimate destruction, many more Adena log tombs were observed. Quote, the bulldozer operator whose job it was to level this mound still recalls two decades later digging through many log tombs. From his accurate description, it is evident that the most common type of tomb was the simple two-dimensional log structure constructed by laying two logs on each side of a rectangle around the body, unquote. So God only knows where these skeletons went to. They were busy bulldozing them. And uh, thanks to Alice Herdlitschka, you know, it was just all okay. The recorded details suggest that the spearhead man was constructed in a similar manner to the large late Adena mounds from Kentucky and West Virginia. As the size of the tumulus grew, with subsequent episodes involving the addition of more log tombs, cremations, and earth mantles over time. <coughs> Interpretations of Spearhead Mound Native American tribes of the eastern woodlands and the plains viewed the cosmos as divided into three realms, quote-unquote. The above realm, the earth realm, and the beneath realm. The great spirit and the thunderbirds inhabit the above realm. The earth realm is the world in which living humans, plants, and animals live. And the beneath realm is a watery abyss beneath the earth inhabited by great serpents. Okay? They don't exactly say snakes here. Okay? But here we go. The great horned serpent which I think is what's depicted all over the Northeast, including on Jimmy the Paleo Mountain Man's property up in Vermont, out by Dennis D's, okay, he goes over that in his video, and you can see clearly, and I've seen it so many other times in the ceremonial landscapes of uh, New England, <coughs> Facebook page, it's the same horned serpent over and over and over again, okay. So, the ruler beneath the realm is the, quote, great horned serpent, unquote, or the underwater panther, quote, unquote, underwater panther, I like that, a being, a being associated with floods and danger, but also magic and medicine. A perpetual war exists between the thunderbirds of the above realm and the great serpents of the beneath realm. This conflict is routinely acted out in the earth realm as the thunderbirds hurl great bolts of lightning down upon the serpents whenever they use springs, rivers, and lakes as points of access into the earth realm. Very interesting, maybe related to the Thunderbolts project, who knows, you know, more kind of a symbolic representation of what was going on back then that we don't know anything about, according to Velikovsky. Okay, so some art depicting a Thunderbird, <coughs> a deviant art. I used to look at art there. Excuse me. It has been suggested that the Adena conical burial mounds were representative of an axis mundi or world tree, which joined the three realms of this cosmological scheme. The construction of the spearhead mound along Little Dry Run could have been an intentional use of natural water source to reference the beneath realm aspect to the triune cosmology. There are at least three other smaller Adena mounds which were evenly spaced 200 yards, 182.88 meters apart in a line along Little Dry Run. In fact, many Adena mounds are found along rivers or near natural springs and lakes. Again, water culture, folks, and the great horned serpent. Okay, we have that all over New England. This includes the original Adena mound on the Worthington Estate in Ross County, Ohio which was built next to Lake Ellensmere and included soils from the lake in its construction. 
Archaeologist William Romaine has suggested that the new earthworks in Lincoln County, Ohio, were deliberately built in an area surrounded by natural water sources to reflect the quote-unquote island earth sitting upon the primordial sea. By burying the dead together inside of the representation of the action Mundi, the Adena communities came together to construct the spearhead mound, while likely adopting a common mythic ancestry with strength and social bonds among the living. As a symbolic axis mundi, the mound also served to facilitate the travel of souls of the dead to other realms. Interesting. Okay, it is the part of the mound at the Newark Earthworks. I believe that's a golf course there now and maybe you know it's good that it is because they're being sort of preserved that way until they somebody sells it for uh, land you know building development land becomes scarce The Axis Mundi or World Tree also serves as a quote, a vertical, sub a vertical structure by which a shaman can take magical flights to non ordinary worlds above and below this one, unquote. That's Car in Case 2006. One of the artifacts documented from the Spearhead Man is an Adena tubular smoking pipe inscribed with a bird like effigy or pattern. Interesting, another Adena tubular pipe adorned with a bird design was found at the Swanton Burial Site in Vermont. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Okay, up in Vermont where all these stone walls are and the corn serpent wall up at Jimmy's property and up in uh, Mount Ephraim where we found also effigies in the walls. The Adena also produced stylized and engraved stone and clay tablets featuring animistic and symbolic figures, some including raptorial birds. Carr and Case 2006 point out that four of the known tablets, the Cincinnati, Lacan A, Meigs, and Wilmington tablets, depict raptorial birds either at the top of the Axis Mundi or World Tree or ascending its levels. Carr and Case furthermore suggest that the symbolism could represent the shaman merging with the bird spirit to travel along the Axis Mundi and visit different realms above and below. Who knows, still thunderbolts related maybe. Okay, some very interesting designs there. Adena in Cincinnati, these are Adena designs. How very interesting and, you know, sort of... Uh, abstract very interesting <clears throat> perhaps the owner of the two of the pipe with the bird design from spearhead man was a shaman who incorporated the artifact into rituals involving travel along the axis one day as depicted in some adena tablets alternatively if the raptors of adena iconography were stewards of the dead who carried the souls between realms then the owner of the pipe could have been a mortuary ritual special mortuary ritual specialist William Romaine has suggested, ah, shoot, sorry guys, William Romaine has suggested that the imagery of, of raptorial birds at some Hopewell mounds in Ohio could represent the thunderbirds of the above realm. The Hopewell culture was largely contemporary with Adena, and the two cultures considered more or less connected and to have shared in the same cosmological tradition. Historically, tobacco was used by Native American tribes as an offering uh, or intermediary between the earth realm and the Manitouic or spirits who dwelt in the above and beneath realms, the Manitou, such as the Thunderbirds and Great Serpents. In this context, the ritual practice involving Adena pipes with their designs could have included evocations of the Thunderbirds to destroy the Great Serpents to serve as stewards of the dead or to bring rain or other advantages. Okay. So here's that pipe. Bird design. Nice. Adina Effigy Pipe, Cleveland Museum of Art. The Spearhead Mound was pillaged in the 1920s to create a profitable spectacle and was ultimately destroyed in 1940 for gravel operations. It is unfortunately one of the many of hundreds of, of, of important archaeological sites in the Ohio Valley lost to economic gain and quote unquote progress. Okay, so the top image was an Indiana Mound and Mound Cemetery in Marietta, Ohio. Unfortunately, the Spearhead Mound was destroyed in 1940 for gravel operations, quote unquote. 
whatever the heck that means, okay? Jason and Sarah are the authors of Ages of the Giants, a cultural history of the tall ones in prehistoric America. I got to read that. Okay, guys, so, look, you know, even though what's reported here, and they reported them as giants, and they were, you know, of course, they're trying to sensationalize it so they can get business and all that kind of stuff, but as I said in my research on the history of height, anybody, you know, born before 1800 um, that would have been six foot or taller would be of unusual height. Okay, so much so considered unusual. You won't consider it unusual if it's your common everyday thing. Okay, all right, guys. Anyway, I hope you liked the article. Thank you very much. And please do hit the like button, and I'll be coming to you with a new video soon. All right, Buckhead 7 out. Peace.